Hello class, in lesson 3, 4.1, I'm sorry, 4.1 exponential functions, you'll learn to evaluate exponential functions, graph exponential functions. You'll also learn how to evaluate a function with base e and use the compound interest formula. So let's look at what an exponential function is. Now an exponential function is any function that's written in this format here, where b is going to be a positive constant, co uh, um, constant that is greater than 0, positive again, greater than 0, other than 1. So it cannot equal to 1. And x is going to be any real number, and that's going to be your exponent. So with x being the exponent, this is an exponential function. Here are some examples that are not exponential functions, like x to the second power. That is referred to a power function because you have x raised to the second power. 1 over x, 1 to the x power is not an exponential function because your base has to be some other constant that is not 1, uh, and it cannot be negative. So negative 1 to the x power is not an example of an exponential function. And if you have x to the x power, like in this example on j, this is not an example of an exponential function. Now, don't get it twisted. Be very careful, however, with the negative, um, with a negative base. Like in this example, we have a negative base raised to the power of x, and that's different than having a negative number that's raised to the power of base. So let's say it's a different base. This is the base 10, and we raise it to the power of x. This is an example of an exponential function. But if I have negative 10, and negative 10 is the base, not positive 10, but negative 10 is the base, and that's being raised to the power of x, then this is not an exponential function. So there is a difference. We can have a uh, negatives it's just the base cannot be negative here our base is a positive 10 that positive 10 is being raised to the uh, power of x and then it's being multiplied with a negative here the 10 is being multiplied by the negative first and then being raised to the power of x so that's the difference between a function that has a base a negative base raised to power and a power raise a uh, base raised to a power and then multiplied by the negative So let's look at how to evaluate an exponential function. Well, to evaluate an exponential function, we just simply have to plug in the corresponding value, the corresponding input value. So right here, we want to figure out the average amount spent to the nearest dollar after four hours. So that means we want to evaluate this function with f x, I'm sorry, is equal to four. So f of four. So 42.2 times 1.56 to the fourth power. So let's evaluate this. Let's bring out this calculator. Let's put it on the side view. And let's write this in. So we have 42.2, 1.56, and we're going to raise it to the fourth power. So carrots and then four. And that's equal to a total of $249.92 technically 93 cents because it's 92.5 so 93 cents and to the nearest dollar this approximates to $250 so this is your answer and how you evaluate an exponential function Let's see, let's look at what else we have. Now, before we go into more I, more ideas and more topics on exponential functions, let's do a quick review on a rational function. A rational function, a uh, rational exponent, I'm sorry, rational exponent. A rational exponent is when our exponent is a fraction, like one over n. This is equivalent to taking the nth root of that base a in this situation. So, for example, if a is raised to the one half power, then we're taking the square roots, the index is 2, and we're taking the square root of a. If a is raised to the 1 fifth power, then we're taking the fifth root of a. Now, building on that idea, if a is raised to a fraction and it's not 1 over n instead of m over n, and if the nth root of a represents a real number, and m over n is a positive rational number where n is greater than or equal to 2, then 
the rational exponents is equivalent to the nth roots, the roots of the denominator, and a is raised to the numerator of that rational exponent. So for example, if 8 is raised to the 2 thirds power, that means we're taking the third root of 8 to the second power, or we can also write this as the nth root of a, and then raise it to the power of m, which is the equivalency of taking the eighth root of 8, and then raising it to the second power. They all give you the exact same solution. Let me write, let me show you again what they're equal to. 8 to the 2 third power is equal to 4. This one here, this one right here in the middle, first raises 8 to the second power and then take his, takes the third root. So it takes this, the third root of 64, since 8 to the second power is 64. To get this root here on the 84, you click on math and you select the fourth option, as you see right here. Let me highlight it, the fourth option. And we take the root of 64. And that again gives you 4. And in this notation here, we first get the root of 8, the third root of 8, and then raise it to the second power. Well, the third root of 8 is 2, and raising that to the second power again equals 4. So notice that every single one of these gives us the same solution of 4. So again, a very quick and brief review on rational exponents. Now, how do we graph these exponential functions? Well, you're going to notice again that these exponential functions have a horizontal isotope. The domain, first of all, let's discuss the domain. The domain for these rational functions is all real numbers. And the range for these things is going to be the y values greater than 0. This here, again, excluding any type of horizon uh, vertical, I'm sorry, vertical translation, is your horizontal isotope. Okay, so you're always going to have a horizontal isotope at the x-axis, y is equal to 0, So, and your graph is always going to be above this. And the reason for that is because since we're getting the base of 2, the base of 2, and raising it simply to powers, we're multiplying 2 by itself. So we're multiplying a positive 2 by, uh, uh, by itself every single time. So hence, we're going to get a positive value every, uh, as an output every time. So let's see what this graph looks like when we plug in these three numbers, just to get a general idea. Something close to the origin. Let's start by plugging in 0. If I plug in 0, 2 to the 0 power is equal to 1. Anything to the 0 power is 1. If I use 1, 2 to the 1 power, again, it has only one factor of 2, so that gives us 2. And 2 to the second power is 2 factors of 2, so 2 times 2, and that's 4. Now, the difference between having a positive exponent and a negative exponent is that the negative exponents simply give you the reciprocal of these values. So, like, for example, 2 to the negative 1 power, that's the equivalence to 1 over 2 to the positive 1 power, which is equal to 1 half. So notice that all we did is simply get the reciprocal of this value. For a positive one, we get 2, and for a negative one, we get the reciprocal, 1 half. 2 to the negative 2 power by the negative exponent rule is 1 over 2, changing the exponent to a positive 2. And well, that simply means it's 1 half times 1 half, which is equal to 1 fourth. And again, look at the characteristics between negative 2 and positive 2 for x. The output value is a positive 4, while the output value here is a positive 1 over 4, simply the reciprocal of that. So let's graph this then.
So at zero, we have a y value, let's do it in blue. We have a y value of one. At one, we have a y value of two. And at two, we have a y value of four. Okay, it's not a straight line, it curves. At negative one, the y value is a half, so in the middle. And then at negative two, it's one fourth. So that's halfway between one half and zero. So right there. And if I get any more points, I'm simply just going to end up still getting positive values, which are going to be, again, just simply getting closer and closer to the x-axis, but never actually touching it. So our graph will look like this. And this is, again, our the graph of f of x. Notice how we intersect the y-axis at 0, 1. Notice that when x is equal to 1, the y value is 2, again the base of our exponential function. And because as x approaches negative infinity, as I decrease the value of x again to negative infinity, the function values are going to get closer and closer to 0. And we can see that, look, if I raise 2 to the negative 10, that's equal to that value there. But if I raise that to the negative 100, oops, look, scientific notation. That means we have 0 0.30 zeros before we see the number 7, 8, and so on. So that's a very, very small number, a number, again, really close to zero. If I try to use something bigger, that's not going to work. So let me try 2 to the negative 50. Let's see if we get something. No, that's still scientific notation. Negative 15. OK. Oh negative 15 I put negative nope that's still in scientific notation 2 to the no you see that's gonna be 0 and then 0 point this number right here on the calculator is 0 point four zeros and then 305 so This one right here gives us again 0 0.0009. So again, it's really close to zero, but not going to be less than that. And the, mo the, sm the smaller I make x, again, make x get closer and closer to infinity, make the x values approach infinity, the closer I'm going to get to zero. I'm never going to go below it, though. And, and what, does, what does that mean? Well, that means that we have a horizontal isentope along the x-axis okay so our x-axis is going to be a horizontal isentope and the range will always be greater than that right there again excluding any type of reflection or vertical shift let's see let's graph another example let's graph this one right here I wrote those numbers backwards. Negative 2 first, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. We want those numbers to increase. And let's see. Well, again, if I plug in 0, 1 half to the 0 power, that's equal to 1. 1 half to the 1 half power, 1 half, I'm sorry, 1 half to the first power, that's 1 half. And 1 half to the second power, well, we already did that from the previous one. We know that's equal to 1 fourth. Having x be a negative, and having our x be a negative is simply going to get the reciprocal of this and give it just the reciprocal values of 1 and 2 respectively. So at 1, we're going to get 4 this time. And at negative 2, we're going to get, I'm sorry, at negative 1, we get positive 2. And at negative 2, we get the reciprocal of 1 over 4, which is simply 4.
get there we go we're graphing g of x along the x-axis and let's plot this in blue so at negative 2 we now have a y value at positive 4 negative 1 we have a y value at negative 2 0 1 1 1 half and 1 1 fourth So our function looks like this. Now look at this. Look at the connection. If I re get the reciprocal of 1 half and write this as 2 over 1 instead of 1 over 2, by the negative exponent rule, that changes the exponent from a positive x to a negative x. So I can write g as 2 to the negative x power. Now, if you remember transformations, multiplying our x with a negative is the going to result in a horizontal transformation, specifically a horizontal reflection. Notice how this graph is a reflection of 2 to the positive x power. Look at it. They're both reflected across this point here. This point is now on this side. This point is now over here and this point is over there. So they simply reflect each other. And how neat is that? Because of this, we can look at some characteristics of this. And that correlates again to this one right here. If the value of b, if our b is a number between one, between zero and one, again a positive number obviously, between 0 and 1 then the graph is going to go downwards like the one we see right here and it's going to be a mirror reflection of the same base the reciprocal base because we essentially just have b to a negative x power so we have a a horizontal reflection Now, the one thing I didn't discuss in the graphs, again, before we talked about the horizontal isotope, we discussed again that the domain is all real numbers and that for every value of zero, again, not pending any type of horizontal or vertical translation, our y coordinate is always going to be one because b to the zero power is always equal to one. Anything to the power of zero is equal to one. So our y-intercept is always going to be at 1, and there is no x-intercept. Again, from the original function, from the parent function, the quote-unquote parent function, again, excluding any type of translations, this is what's going to be true about this parent, about this function, exponential function, every single time. As soon as we, trans or as soon as we start translating it, reflecting it, then th some things are going to change, obviously, as a result. But this, again, should be the general idea of what these exponential functions look like. Now, the exponential function that, uh, that uh, de um, decreases, this is referred to as a decay. And the exponential function that increases, the blue one, this is referred to as a growth. Now, the format for transformations of exponential function are represented here in this table. Your vertical translations again add to the b to the x power or subtract to the b to the x power and result again in the relative shifts, upward shifts that we add and downward shifts that we subtract. For a horizontal translation, we're going to add or subtract this constant, this value of c, to the input values, so x plus c, x minus c as you see again in the second part of our table, second cell of our table. Now remember, if we want to shift it to the left, we add this value of c, and if we subtract this value of c, we shift this function to the right, c units. Our vertical reflection and horizontal reflection, again respectively, by multiplying our bx, our function by a negative, or multiplying our input value by a negative results, in a horizontal reflection, a reflection across the y-axis, as the example that we saw. 
Now the vertical and horizontal shrinks and stretches again are resulting again the same way of, as the reflections. We're just simply multiplying by a scale factor, not necessarily a positive or negative number. Again, just a number again that we consider just to be positive and the absolute value of that. And we end up with the same type of th situation. If we multiply C with a number greater than 1, then that's going to stretch it vertically. And if that number is less than 1, still positive, but less than 1, then it's going to result in a shrink. The opposite thing occurs when we multiply the input value with that con scale factor. If that number is greater than 1, then it results in a horizontal shrink. But if that number is l less than 1, but still positive, then that results in a horizontal stretch. So let's use the information or the graph of f of x is equal to 3 to the x power to obtain the graph of g of x. So let's just quickly graph f of x. And we'll do them in two separate coordinate grids. So this would be the coordinate grid for f of x. Again, because the y-intercept is always going to be at 0, and at 1, this has one factor of 3, we're going to have a y-coordinate of 3. Again, I know, oops, 3. This should be up higher. My exponential function, again, is going to look like this. This is what my exponential function looks like. So we have this point here at 1, 3, and this point on the y-intercept at 0, 1. Well, what is this function going to do? What is g of x going to do? Well, g of x is shifting our function one unit to the left. So this here is going to shift it one unit to the left. So this point here, along with everything else, is one unit to the left. So we're going to have a point at negative 1, 1. And this point, shifted one unit to the left, is now going to be on the y-axis, which is at 0, 3. So the over general shape of the graph is going to look the same, but those key points along with other key points are going to be shifted to the left by 1. So we're now going to intercept the y-axis at 3, and the point, the y-intercept of 0, 1 has now been shifted one unit over. And we could do again, do some real simple math to verify that. If I have x equal to negative 1 and 0, look what happens. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0, and 3 to the 0 power is 1. If I have x be 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, and 3 to the first power is 3. So you see, it matches it exactly to what I said it was going to do. Let's see, pause the video and try to graph this function and come back and check your work. So let's see what this function, let's go back and check your work. So let's see what this function looks like. Well, so let's do it in blue. We already graphed this function before, okay? So we know that's going to look like this, where we're going to have the y-intercept again at 0, 1. And at 1, the y-coordinate is going to be 2. Again, it's always going to match to the base. This is going to shift our graph 3 units down. So let's shift the three units down. So this point, shifting it down three units, one, two, three, is going to be there. But 
student, right? That's going to be at 0, negative 2. Shifting it down 3 units, this point 1, 2, 3 is going to be there. At 1, negative 1. And the shape of our graph is going to be the same. Now notice again, I didn't refer to this last time, but our horizontal isotope is there. That's also going to be shifted down 3 units. So our horizontal isotope, which is normally at y is equal to 0, is now 3 units lower. So which is at y is equal to negative 3. If I do another point 2, that's going to be 9, 5. And that's going to be somewhat like this. So our graph is going to look something like this. So this is what the graph is going to look like. Focusing on the shift of the y-intercept and where that y-intercept moves, again, is very important, along with the horizontal isotopes, makes it easiest for us to see what the graph looks like. Now, on the previous example, I didn't focus on the horizontal intercept because, I'm sorry, the horizontal isotope, because that was going to stay the same. That's still on the x-axis for both of them since all I'm doing is just shifting it horizontally that does not affect the location of the horizontal isotope it's still in the same height now of course it also has been shifted but because the line is horizontal again we still end up crossing every single x-coordinate and well everything along the x-axis so it doesn't look like we shifted at all because it's still going to be in the same uh, y value of zero but when we cause a vertical shift, then that is obvious. We can obviously see that it has been shifted vertically, and in this situation, three units down. Okay, now those are just examples with bases of two, three, again, of natural, of whole numbers, of natural numbers. But now let's talk about the natural base E. Now, this number E is an irrational number that is a result of getting 1 plus 1 over n to the n power and making this value of n here very very big crazy enough is that this number again appears as the base of many applied exponential functions especially in financing okay when banks again are trying to determine how uh, how many times to compound the principal and how much money uh, an account is going to earn when we try to do it an infinite number of times and compound infinitely continuously, they uh, approach again this number right here. This number gets approximated to 2.72, but again, this is an irrational number. And again, it's the, is referred to as a natural base. Any exponential function where the base is e is referred to as a natural exponential function. And again, you can see here the table when I make this value of n from 1 to 2 to 5 to 10 to 100,000 and so on, even to a billion, notice again that this number gets closer and closer to 2.72, approximately 2.72 every single time. And in calculus, we express this number as the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n power we get again this value of E, the natural base. Now, like I said, we use this natural base a lot in financing and in specifically in compound interest and determining again how much uh, money is in an account that the interest is compounded in an instantaneous basis. Now, for, the sum, uh, for example here, this, uh, uh, this formula right here is the formula that we use again to determine the principal, um, uh, the amount in an account that pays, that uh, starts by saving a principal amount and adding again a rate to that. Because the interest is added to the principal at the year's end, this is solved again, like I said, by this formula here. Now, if this is accumulated again over a period of time, and we're going to again add this principal more in multiple years, then we multiply again this 1 plus r relative to the number of years again that we're going to add or have this money in this account. So 
where we have again eight eight thousand dollars again for zero years it doesn't earn us again any money but as soon as I put it into account after one year it's gonna earn me not only the principal the eight thousand dollars but also again is going to earn me the rate in which it was multiplied by. So the $8,000 gets multiplied by a rate, giving me an interest, and it gets added to that $8,000. And now I do it for multiple years, and I add it and multiply it one more time for three years. I get the previous answer, and then multiply another one, so a total of three. Four years, I get the previous answer, multiply that with one, another uh, one plus R again for four years, and so on. So if it's again for an unknown, undisclosed number of years the formula becomes this and this formula gives you the balance again the balance that a principal P is worth after T years of interest rates compounded again only once a year however most savings institutes have a plan in which the interest is paid more often than once a year for example, if the bank is going to, if the savings institute is going to compound the interest semi-annually, that means it's going to do it twice in a year. And if you do it four times a year, that's referred to as compounded quarterly. And some plans allow for monthly compounding or daily compounding, depends again on the savings institute and what their plan's options are. This table right here gives you just a general format of what these compounded are. So for a semi-annual compound, that means you're going to compound it again in six months, which is twice a year. Quarterly compound is done every three months, which is going to be four times in a year. Monthly compounded, well that's going to be every month, which is again because it, there's 12 months in a year, that'll be 12 times in a year. And daily compounding results again in compounding your interest 365 times because that's again in a daily basis where well, you're going to do it every single day so that's 365 times in a year because that again it matches its equivalent to the number of days in a year so because of this this formula and compounding it again more times more than once becomes this formula right here where n represents the compounding periods per year and each time the interest rate is divided by that amount and there are n times n t times periods in t years so not only do we divide this by n but we also multiply the time by n because that's the number of times that we do it again in a year so again the formula becomes and it gets augmented to this now let's say i want to do it not just 12 times in a year or daily again let's say I want to do it continuously do it every second every microsecond and so on okay a quadrillionth of a second right then that formula as you'll notice again this 1 plus R over N looks a lot like 1 plus 1 over N raised to the power of N where if I take again this number N and make it very very big this gets closer and closer to E as I make N extremely large. And that's exactly what happens again naturally when we look at this again in a natural sense. If I get this value, do some little math right here, some factoring and some rules that I am allowed to do, I end up again with this notation here. And if I make this value of h approach infinity, by definition, this is going to equal again to e, the irrational number base e, which then augments our formula to this. So now we have two formulas. One formula for compounding our interest n number of times. And then the second formula where we're going to compound the interest a continuous number of times. And let's see how this works. So let's say again I have a decision to make. I have $8,000 that I want to invest for six years and I have two choices. I could put it in one account that pays 7% interest but is compounded on a monthly basis. So that means that I'm going to use this formula here. Sorry, it starts with A. The amount in the account 
will equal to the principal, the amount I start off with, times 1 plus r divided by n raised to the n times t power. Where compounding monthly means that the value of n is going to be 12. So let's plug in some values. So 8,000, 1 plus my interest rate is 7%, which is 0 0.07, compounded monthly. So replacing again n with 12, and t is going to be again for 6 years. Let's see what this equals to. Point zero 0.07 divided by 12. Close the parentheses and let's raise that to 12 times 6. That is equal to a total of $12,160.84. Now let's look at, let me hide this. Now let's look at the second option. The second option pays 6.85% per year compounded continuously. So compounded continuously means we use this formula here. I don't know why I keep writing P. I mean to write A. A is equal to P times E to the R times T power. So the $8,000 times E, our rate R, which is again now 0 0.0685 multiplied with six years because again the time is not going to change we're still going to do this for six years so let's see what this equals to so we have eight thousand our value of e here let me delete this i don't need that right there our value of e is in blue is right above the ln key so i have to first hit the alpha key the second i'm sorry the second key the one that i just highlighted in red and then the ln button which is right there you couldn't see it, but it's right next to the number 4. You see the letters E to the X power. Now this automatically inputs the letter E and gives me the exponent box. So in that exponent box, I'm going to write in 0 0.0685 and multiply that with 6 years. And that gives us a total of $12,066.60. So look, even though it's compounded continuously, the shorter interest rates really affected the overall price and the account balance on the second one than on the first one. So the higher interest rate, again, really is the benefit here. And compounding twice, 12 times a year earns you more money than having to do it every single microsecond, millionth of a second, a quadrillionth of a second, okay, every moment in uh, time um, gives you still more money than d doing it this way. And that's all more than likely because of that number right there, the interest rates. Had it been seven, this would probably gain you more money because the interest rate would have been the same. So m decreasing it by 0.15% made a huge difference in how much money you're going to make after six years. Well, all right, beautiful. Well, that concludes again the notes, the examples on f lesson 4.1. If you have any questions, please send me a message on Remind or through email. I appreciate you watching and I hope you have a great day.